So, how y'all doing? <laughs> well, y'all, you're such troopers, you're still here. So, let me just tell you, um, I'm, I'm super excited about the presentation that just came before, because usually, whenever somebody gets up to talk about how cities should be organized, um, they always use some examples and, and, uh, of what not to do. And, and usually it's Houston. And thank God for Los Angeles. Los Angeles is like that old uncle you have that's a real screw up. And you're always glad when he comes to Thanksgiving dinner because next to him you look good like that. So anyway, I'm telling you really, because Houston does have the largest freeway in the world. And uh, we're, we're working on that. Um, so this is, this is uh, skipping ahead a little. The measure of a great city, I hear today all the aspirations you have to be a great city. And frankly, so much of what I've heard already tells me that you are. But for me, that measure of a great city is not who's there. It's not the architecture. It's not the museums. It's not the infrastructure. It's not the freeways or the electric cars. The measure of a great city is who's welcome in that city. And Houston uh, has become the most diverse city in the United States by being a welcome, welcoming city. And I've had a front line, front row seat for the transformation of Houston over the last 30 years. And it's been really remarkable. So I believe when people come to a city or when they've come from a neighborhood to opportunity, uh, I like to say whether you're crossing the tracks, the river, or the ocean, you need a place to begin. And Houston had a neighborhood that was one of the most troubled neighborhoods in the region. It was a neighborhood that everybody talked about in terms of what was wrong with it. And there was a long list. But it was also the most diverse neighborhood in Houston. And using a set of contributions from the public, private, and nonprofit sector, a few years ago, we built this five-building, four-acre site in the heart of this really, really uh, troubled neighborhood. And it has a credit union and a school and a library, and it has a welcome center and immigration services, and has a clinic, because we really believe that all neighborhoods need all of those things. And we've tried for many years to transform neighborhoods on the backs of one or the other of the elements of what makes a great neighborhood. And it really hasn't worked. So we set out in Gulfton to build something that would be holistic and complete and inspiring because we had to welcome people from everywhere. We did our community meetings in Gulfton in eight languages, Arabic, Urdu, Spanish, English, Chinese, Vietnamese. And you know, that was pretty darn exciting. And we had to paint it some colors that made everybody feel at home. And it's a magnet now. Uh, for, uh, it's a magnet for aspiration in Houston. And, but wherever you go in the world, you find these places, the landing places, the places that people start in neighborhoods to try to figure out how to rebuild a life from their own imagination, how to work out a way forward that's different than the life they were born to. So this is a place in Germany, and this place is in Berlin, and it's a site of welcome for some of the 1.1 million Syrians Germany's taken in. So I really believe that welcoming cities really need these landing places, these places of welcome. And the most successful cities of the future, um, no disrespect to all of the other ideas, will be those cities that can turn desperation and aspiration into participation, who can build the means by which people can take the deep hunger they have to matter, to participate, and turn that into a real sense of belonging. So we like to talk about poverty. In fact, sometimes I believe, I don't know what some people would do without poverty, because you know we like to stack up the studies about it and admire the problem. And I feel like there's a couple of different ways to be poor, and one is when your belly growls, and the dollars you earn don't make it to the end of the month, and that's a scary kind of poverty. You don't want to be evicted, you don't want to be able, you don't want to be not able to pay your kids' school fees. But there's another kind of poverty and desperation that goes with that kind. It's the feeling that maybe there's not a place for you in the world. 
In my definition of place, the significance of place is the one we make for people and the one we allow them to make for themselves in the cities uh, that we're creating together. So generally speaking, when we set out to help poor neighborhoods or poor people, we have these fabulous deficit models. And it says if you really want some revitalization money, then you write up a report and you make it really 10 feet tall and four feet thick, and you document the hell out of everything wrong with your neighborhood. And if it's bad enough, we'll give you a little money. Now, it's not going to be enough, and it's not going to last long enough to make a difference. But this model of prove to us how broken you are, and then we'll support it, that's harmful. Because we really, at neighborhood centers, we don't see poor neighborhoods that way. Last year, we helped 525,000 people. That was the number of folks whose lives we touched in one of our 70 locations. And over and over and again, in every neighborhood, we find something much more than lacks gaps, needs, and wants. We believe that change begins with the first new question. And when we want to help neighborhoods and when we want to work with people, it's not about what's missing or broken and all the ways they've failed to live up to our measure of success. It's really about what's working here, who's working here, what gives life to this community, what has this community been able to figure out for itself? What problems have they solved? What businesses have they created? What relationships have they tended and nurtured over the years? Because we can build on that. And when we set out to work in communities, when we set out to work in these communities, we document what we hear from the people in those communities about what matters most to them. And we do that with the same dedication and rigor that people usually document what's wrong. And we weave an entirely new story about that community and neighborhood. And the story in Gulfton, the story we found in Gulfton were people that had taken enormous risk for the, in the hopes of a better life. We found tremendous ability and willingness to take risk, a real spirit of experimentation and innovation. And that's the foundation for how we invest with the community in neighborhoods because you can't build on broken. And you know, I just gotta say one little aside here. You know, folks like to talk about concentrated poverty. Well, Houston's 627 square miles. It's really hard to get to the level of concentration of anything that people will find compelling. As I explained in DC once, we couldn't get all the poor people to live in one neighborhood. But we do have poor neighborhoods, and I always feel like if you wanna make a poor neighborhood less poor, um, and you're really concerned about concentration concentrations of wealth and poverty, we should just get some rich people to move into the poor neighborhood, and that would just improve things a lot. So I think you can't build on broken. I believe strongly that every, every single neighborhood, every community has strengths and resources and assets, and unearthing that, that relentless search for those, that's the, the journey I've been on for over 30 years. And we find people in communities, we find people like Khalid and his daughter. Khalid took 13 years to get to the United States, to get to this country from Pakistan because of the hope he had for his daughter. He will do anything to, for his kids' education. He will volunteer, and he did. He will work hard. He will learn another language because his journey took him from Pakistan to Russia, where he learned a little Russian, to Chile, where he learned some Spanish, and then finally to Houston, Texas. This is a, when you build with people side by side, not in front of them, dragging them along, behind them, pushing them in the direction you want them to go in, but with them. Um, then you find that there's no need to motivate. Uh, you're capitalizing on the motivation that already exists. So the leaders we need in every community are already there, and part of what we do is search for them. They're the voice and the heart of the community. This is part of, first we build community, and then you build the school and the housing 
and the center and whatever else the community is asking for because what you create out of the aspirations of community will be authentic. So now, what happens if in truth you're just about to bulldoze everything? So every now and then a developer will come to neighborhood centers um, and they will say to me, can you help us engage the community? Because we have a plan for this neighborhood and we want them to like it. And we say, well, that's not exactly community engagement. That's pretty much you decide, you have money, you have power, and you've decided what's gonna happen and now you want to stick us in there between you and the folks it's gonna impact and make them like it. That's not engagement. And we say no to that. Engagement is when you start with the aspirations of the community and your investment is driven by what the community is trying to achieve for itself. So we like to say, yeah, listen twice build once. And I'm always getting people saying, well, but isn't that expensive and doesn't that take a long time? And I like to say, well, just think how long it takes if you make a mistake and how expensive it is to build something no one wants to use and people don't feel welcome in and isn't aligned at all with their priorities or Khalid's desperation for a better life for his daughter. That takes a long time. That's really expensive. So I want you to know, I don't want you to think for a minute I'm a philosopher or a scholar or a policymaker. I am a practitioner. I get up every day and I go and try to make this work. And this is what it looks like. This is a bunch of people coming together. Right now, we're about to build another big project like Baker Ripley. And these are the folks in Aldine that have outlined a vision for their center and it's a really wonderful vision that's built on the strengths of Aldine. Aldine's a poor neighborhood, and when Houston went on its annexing binge in the 80s and 90s, we got to Aldine, and it turned out, well, the folks there were pretty poor, and if we annexed them, then we'd have to pay for a lot of things. Their property taxes weren't going to cover. So we just annexed around them and left them on their own. Now that they're on their own, they actually took that as an opportunity to build whatever the hell they wanted, any way they wanted, anywhere they wanted. And what you see in Aldine is a lot of creative housing solutions. You see a lot of multi-purpose dwellings, you see a lot of things that you've never seen anywhere else. And they're wonderful, they're authentic. They're created out of the, their aspirations. So what we build there, has to look like what they've created for themselves, only more so. And it's hard because you hire architects and fancy people with beautiful ideas and they think, this is my big opportunity. I'm going to get to design that building I always dreamed of building. And you say, not really. You're really going to design the thing that people can feel at home in. Places where they can do these three things. Because here's what we've learned. There's three hungers that unite everybody across the globe, everywhere I've been. It's the hunger to earn, learn, and belong. It's easy to remember. And when it comes to measurement, this one is simple. I've been through all the logic models and collective impact, and God only knows, God bless you funders, what you're going to come up with next um, that's going to require me to turn in a million new reports. However, when I want to know whether I really am doing something that's making a difference, are we producing, delivering a program that's changing lives? These are the three things that matter in every community we work in. Are people earning and can they keep more of what they earn? Are we raising their ability to, uh, to their wages? Are, we in, are their incomes going up? The second thing, are they learning? Are their children learning? This is a hunger we all have. And I'll tell you, many parents may have given up on the possibility they'll ever learn again or anything more. They may have accepted they'll have a lifelong struggle, but they can't accept it if that's their children's lot. They won't accept their kids not having a better opportunity. So earn, learn, and belong. Social connection, there are lots of fancy names for it. I call it neighbors living as friends. It's our way to see to it that people come together, learn from one another, have a voice, and be able to exercise it on their own behalf. So while you're doing this work, and I'm speaking to all you community development folks out there, 
Um, all the while you're actually getting stuff done, there'll be a whole collection of people standing around you saying really helpful things like, well, that'll never work and no one's going to fund it and it's not scalable and it's not replicable and it's going too slow and it's not going fast enough. It's too big. It's too small. And my personal favorite, right in the middle of raising money for Baker Ripley, somebody said to me, that has a snowball's chance in hell of ever being built. And our snowball's chance in Houston is about the same as in hell. So I knew exactly what he meant, but we did do it anyway. So the thing is, don't start if you're a careerist. Don't start if you're worried about what your reputation is going to be. Don't start if you have to have everything you do be a success. Because this is hard work, and in the midst of uh, raising money for something, you might find that there's a big economic downturn or a hurricane or he heaven knows what else. You have to make a commitment to see it through. It's called leadership, and what gets led gets done. So I'm going to, um, yeah. So I have to say, I really love, love the uh, street musicians in New Orleans. Because here's a street musician in New Orleans. The street musician doesn't go out on the street and say, well, when someone gives me some money, I'm going to play. When somebody provides me a plan and some sheet music, I'm going to play. When someone builds me a stage, I'm going to play. So a lot of community development work, a lot of creating these landing places and on-ramps, it's improvisation. It's the process. You go out with the instrument, you start playing. You get going. You work with what you have. And whenever you think you don't have much, I've just come from the oldest refugee camp in Lebanon. This is a camp with no green space because everything is built this close together. So they're figuring it out, how to put the gardens on the roofs of the houses. So in every community, everywhere, every part of the world, there are strengths and resources and assets that can be built upon. But when you begin the building process, this is a really important leadership message, and it's a tough one, and I always agonize about whether or not to say it. We are all standing, always, on sacred ground. We're standing on the ground of things that came before us, of dreams and hopes and buildings that stood right where we're standing that meant something to someone. We're standing on, on sometimes the failed policies of the past. We're standing, as I did in Lower Ninth, at the break in the levee after Katrina. And in those moments when you find yourself standing on that ground where there's been great loss and disappointment and hurt of the past, if you need to be the one who can say, I am so sorry, it doesn't have to be that you did it. You just have to be willing to own it in that moment and acknowledge it. And, and acknowledge it. <laughs> That's how we move on by moving through it. So, so I'm going to wrap up with um, a couple of uh, thoughts here. Uh, I've been invited to some really fancy cities. Uh, they had like, I don't know, 12 different kinds of public transit. I was scared to walk anywhere because there were bicycles and motorbikes. And I mean, there's all kind of stuff happening. I'm pretty much just used to a car. So, you know, I've been invited to cities that were stunning and they're featured in every urbanist journal in the world, but really never, ever, ever make a place more precious than the people because it really has to work for the people living in this city. And the people you need to make this a great city are already here. And make sure what you create is welcoming for them. Make sure the roots that they've put down are fed and nurtured. Because that's how you grow a really great city. And when you get discouraged, just remember that everything you deposit in the minds and hearts of people is sustainable. It lasts forever. These little guys are in our school. It's one of our schools that's 200 kids in 42 countries of origin. And they're best friends. And I bet you remember your best friend in third grade. What we deposit, 
what we create for people that allows them to earn, learn, and belong, and be connected, it lasts. That's real sustainability, and that's real transformation. So I'm enormously honored that you would invite me here. I'm hugely excited for you about the journey you're on. Thank you so much for letting me share. Thank you.